I am so proud and thrilled to welcome you to Professor Ana Raquel Minyan's lecture. This event wraps up our year-long program, the Feinberg Family Distinguished Lecture Series, entitled Migration Matters, Rethinking Immigration in the Modern Americas. Over the past several months, in cooperation with other departments and programs in the College of Humanities and Fine Arts and across our campus, we have heard from several top scholars in the field of migration studies, held workshops, screened films, and performances. A lot of really great stuff. While this event wraps up this academic year series, so you're here for a treat, um, we asked for you to keep abreast of our department's many other events and the return of the new Feinberg um, event in 2016 into 2017. That is, every second year, the history department organizes this endowed lecture series around a specific topic. In this capacity, we examine difficult and controversial issues in depth. In 2004, the inaugural series commemorated race, law, and civil rights, 50 years of Brown versus Board of Education. Our second series was on politics and protest, the 1960s and now. And in 2008, the focus was on measuring the value of human life, using Kenneth Feinberg, um, his book, as the anchor reading. Our 2010 series turned to sport and society and history. And our last Feinberg, we dedicated ourselves to the study of truth and reconciliation. The Feinberg activities are possible only because of the generosity of Mr. Kenneth R. Feinberg, a 1967 alumnus um, at the University of Massachusetts History Department, and, my, and his family and friends. Mr. Feinberg completed his BA in history, um, of course, right here at UMass, and went on to distinguished career in law and public service. He is one of the country's leading experts in mediation and alternative dispute resolution. Feinberg worked on the Presidential Advisory Commissions on Human Radiation Experiments and on catastrophic nuclear accidents. He served as Special Master of the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund and administer administered the BP Deepwater Horizon Disaster Victim Compensation Fund. Recently, as many in this room may know, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts appointed Mr. Feinberg to oversee the distribution of the Victim Compensation Fund for the Boston Marathon bombings. Speaking on this campus during the 2010 series, Mr. Feinberg articulated his conviction um, that the study of history is instrumental in understanding and analyzing contemporary events. We in the history department could not agree more. Let me take this opportunity to thank the members of the history department who have worked so very hard to put this year's program together. Joel Wolf chaired the Feinberg Committee and was joined by Brian Bunk, Sarah Cornell, and myself. A very special, very special thanks to the History Department's Outreach Director, Jessica Johnson, who worked wonders to bring the Feinberg series to fruition. This year's Feinberg is being offered in collaboration with the History Institute, which is a year-long professional development series for K through 12 teachers that the History Department offers annually in partnership with the Collaborative for Educational Service. If you've already enrolled, there's a sign-in sheet um, for, you to, for, you to, um, for you to sign. Now, it has been a dream of mine to have the opportunity to introduce my media naranja, Professor Ana Minyang. I met Professor Minyang a few years ago at Yale. We immediately connected and have since collaborated in numerous capacities. Um, professor Minyang is Assistant Professor of History and for the Center of Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity at Stanford. She received her PhD in American Studies in 2012, with distinction, I might add, um, where she worked with Professor Stephen Pitty and George Chauncey. From 2013 to 2014, Min Yang worked as a Donald D. Harrington um, faculty fellow at the Center for Mexican American Studies at UT Austin. In a very short time, she has provided new historical interpretations in US, Mexican, inter-American, migration, transnational, gender, and sexuality studies. It's a lot of stuff. Her past publications include an encyclopedia entry on the Western Hemisphere Act and an excellent article in the American Quarterly on the United Farm Workers. In the latter, she offers an alternative narrative um, on the UFW by arguing the union used sexuality as a tool to advance la causa, ultimately promoting a heteropatriarchal vision of that movement that limited its great potential. Her much anticipated book in progress, tentatively titled Undocumented Lives, explores the late 20th century history of Mexican undocumented migration to the United States, the growth of migrant communities, and binational efforts to regulate the border. This work is an expansion and revision of her dissertation, which won the prestigious and competitive Ralph Henry Gravier um, Prize for Best Dissertation in American Studies. 
I've had the great privilege of reading it and later um, even had the chance to review it. And her work, of course, is magnificent and a much needed intervention in several fields. Min Yang's work is a history of belonging, of jumping both fenced and imaginary borders, and the provisional personal and political state of being caught in the middle of a battle larger than the individual. It is a story of a collective coming to the aid of those torn between two governments that refuse to fully incorporate them as part of the nation state. Min Yang unearths undocumented lives that have heretofore been erased from the historical record or relegated to the margins based on the needs of labor magnets. Let me briefly tell you about her archival work and primary sources. She'll begin to tell you about this, but I, I just really want to focus on one part in particular. Anna Minyang has conducted, for instance, over 250 oral history interviews, both in the United States and Mexico, which is just an absolute um, major accomplishment, right? This is not, this is certainly not easy to do. Um, this is, it goes without saying, of course, is an extraordinary accomplishment among um, I, know, I know in some of her talk, you'll we'll, we'll have time to talk a little bit more about all of this. Um, today, she will deliver a talk based on her book project. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ana Raquel Minyang. Well, thank you for that beautiful introduction. I want to thank you all for being here today. I want to thank the Feinberg Committee for inviting me to talk. And I want to thank especially Jessica Johnson and Julio Capo for organizing my visit. I have to say that it's a true honor to be at the university where Professor Capo works. I have known him now for four years, and not only has he become a dear friend of mine, but he's my closest collaborator and the person I admire the most intellectually. His work is methodologically impeccable, brilliant, and groundbreaking. So this is a true honor. Thank you. Currently, about one half of all Mexicans from the state of Zacatecas reside in the United States. Similarly, one third of all of those from the state of Guanajuato live north of the border. And slightly more Michoacanos, those from the state of Michoacan, work in the fields of California, Oregon, and Illinois than the number of Michoacanos who still reside in their home state. Latinos have become the largest and fastest growing minority group in the United States, constituting 16.3% of the population. And there is an estimated 10.3 million undocumented migrants, most of them from Mexico, now residing in the United States. The sheer number of Mexicans who now live north of the border and their importance to politics, economic, and social relations means that their stories have shaped both US and Mexican national histories. Yet very few historians of either Mexico or the United States have written about the history of Mexican undocumented migrants in the post-war period. My work argues that to understand the rise of undocumented migration, the official positions of the US and the Mexican governments, as well as the experiences of workers themselves, we must examine the years between 1965 and 1986. These two dates mark important mark important turning points in the history of Mexican migration. In 1964, the United States ended the Bracero program, a binational guest worker program through which Mexican migrants could come, work in the United States for short periods of time legally, and then return to Mexico. In 1965, when Mexican workers found that they were unable to continue coming legally, because the Bracero program had ended, they continued coming to the United States. But now, they just did it without papers. Still, their migration continued to be circular. They would come, work here for a couple of years without papers, and then return back to Mexico, only to start that process all over again. This pattern ended in 1986 when the US Congress passed the Immigration Reform and Control Act. 
This law further militarized the border. So what this meant was that Mexican nationals continued to come to the United States, but rather than heading back to Mexico only to come back to the United States, States again, they simply decided to reside permanently in the United States. Despite these changes, many of the facets of migration that we see today were shaped by the period ranging between 1965 and 1986. This period, period saw four key shifts in migration. First, it saw a shift towards unprecedented levels of undocumented migration. INS, Immigration and Naturalization Service Apprehensions, rose from 500,000 in 1970 to over one and a half million in 1986. The second shift that it saw was the, a shift in the government policies of both Mexico and the United States. Third, this period also saw the solidification of some of the existing stereotypes that currently exist about undocumented Mexican nationals. And finally, this period forged Mexicans' consciousness towards an idea that undocumented migration was part of their lives. To explore this history and bring out the changing perspectives of the Mexican and US governments, as well as, a, as of the experience of migrants, I will focus my talk today on questions of welfare. This concept, welfare, meant different things to all of the different groups. But I will use the term today to talk about societal expectations on the state. What could people expect from citizenship, and how is this contested? My broader work also addresses ideas about sexuality, gender, race, and ethnicity on migratory patterns. And of course, you're welcome to ask me about these at the end of my talk. Today, I will argue two things. First, that during the period between 1965 and 1986, both the US and the Mexican government came to see working class Mexicans as a hindrance to the economic development of their nation. Both of these governments came to consider Mexican nationals as a superfluous population. My second argument is that in this context, Mexicans themselves started to fight for ways in which they could belong and to seek ways in which they would, could belong in a, in a context in which both of their nation states could not admit them and did not want to admit them. So let me start in the United States. Here, Mex Mexican nationals started to be accused of draining US welfare resources in the 1970s. During this decade, the US economy saw the rapid rise of unemployment and inflation simultaneously. The expansion of welfare came to be considered an urgent national problem. Newspapers often centered on the image of the black, profligate, promiscuous, Cadillac-driving welfare queen, which has led many historians to focus strictly on the associations between black people and welfare abuse. Yet the majority of newspaper articles that talk about the problems created by Mexican migrants also mention their abuse of public aid and services. Articles came out with titles such as Illegal Aliens Here Called Public Services Burden and Welfare System, A Haven for Illegal Aliens. Ironically, undocumented Mexican nationals were ineligible for public welfare, and few of, few of them dared to apply illegally at least six different field studies at the time found that undocumented Mexicans rarely used tax-supported programs for unemployment compensation, welfare assistance, food stamps, and public education, generally in the 1 to 3% range. 
This meant that Mexican migrants were simultaneously accused of draining public welfare and at the same time prevented from applying for it. Still, important lobby groups, and most notably Zero Population Growth, Inc., aim to increase immigration restriction by bringing up stereotypes of undocumented migrants' use of welfare. For example, on March 12, 1975, its vice president, John Tanton, claimed, the illegal, once in the United States, has the opportunity of sending his children to American schools. And should he have difficulty in finding work, he can benefit from many social welfare programs available to him and his family. To deal with this problematic population, Tanton recommended implementing harsher immigration laws. The clearest victory for those pushing for restrictionist policies through this type of discourse occurred in 1976 with the passage of the Western Hemisphere Act. The act established an annual quota of 20,000 immigrants per nation, a clause that affected Mexico in particular, as it was the only nation that, had, that sent more immigrants than 20,000. During the congressional debates over this bill, one of the most common arguments that was brought up against migrants was that they drained welfare. Senator Thurmond of South Carolina argued, in many cases, these illegal entrants and their families soon become a welfare burden on our society, supported in one way or another by American taxpayers. Arguments that Mexican migrants abused welfare did not simply affect the marking of the border through legislative means, but also encouraged INS officials to increase the number of sweeps they conducted. In June 1973, for instance, Donald T. Williams, then acting director of the INS, explained the increasing number of raids by stating, Immigrants attend school at taxpayers' expense. They take jobs that normally would go to Americans, and many of them go on welfare and use other social services. Similarly, representations of Mexicans as welfare abusers led INS agents and the U.S. Attorney General to order a raid on El Concilio Manso, a voluntary social service agency in Tucson, Arizona, that provided support for undocumented migrants. During the raid, INS officials confiscated the records of over 800 clients. They then arrested and subsequently deported 150 individuals who had sought immigration counseling at the center to adjust their status. The purpose of the raid was not only to detain undocumented migrants, but also to uncover evidence that the counselors were helping Latinos make illegal claims for welfare and food stamps. Ultimately, officials found too little evidence to prosecute the agency's leaders. In other words, welfare played a significant role in pushing migrants out of the United States by encouraging officials to introduce legislative changes to immigration law and by encouraging INS officials to conduct more raids in Latino communities. Although Mexicans kept crossing the border and living in the United States, policymakers and citizens accused them of being outsiders, illegal aliens who drained welfare. Now, Mexican officials also changed their migratory policies with regards to the Mexicans who headed to the United States during this period. Although very little has been written about the history of Mexican emigration, the departure of Mexicans from the national territory had a huge impact on life in Mexico and even on the ability of Mexican citizens to claim their belonging in their country of origin. The Mexican government had a very different rhetoric on welfare than did U.S. policymakers. After the Mexican Revolution, the ruling party, the PRI, established itself as a promoter of the Mexican welfare state. According to the PRI, 
the state would advance both rural and urban popular needs through an institutionalized revolution. With this goal in mind, the government followed the, precedent, the, the example of President Lázaro Cárdenas, who ruled from 1934 to 1940. Cárdenas had instituted leftist reform, economic nationalist, agrarian reform, and had modeled itself as a generator of change. Yet even though in the 1970s, the PRI continued to portray itself as the inheritor of the revolution and as a welfare state, it failed to ensure that people had their basic needs satisfied. Up until the 1970s, Mexican policymakers considered that to be able to achieve the twin goals of a welfare state and of economic growth, they had to increase the number of people who resided in the country. They ceaselessly pursued population growth in an attempt to have a large and dynamic workforce. Now, in terms of migration, this meant encouraging those who had already headed to the United States to return back to Mexico. According to government officials, this population had the added advantage of having been modernized in the United States. Repatriation campaigns were one of the most significant efforts of trying to return Mexican migrants from the United States to Mexico. For example, during the Great Depression, Mexican consuls helped to return nearly 20% of the Mexicans who lived north of the border. In the mid-1970s, the Mexican government started to change its position with regards to migration, primarily because of the collapsing economy. During these years, the balance of payment started to run a huge deficit, and consumer prices doubled. Before leaving office in 1976, President Echeverria was forced to devalue the peso, ask for assistance from the IMF, and accept its austerity package. The period between 1970 and 1982 saw so many difficulties that Mexicans refer to these years as the tragic dozen. Mexican officials debated how to solve the, Mexi the, the nation's economic problems. Should they expand the welfare state even further? Should they change their policies? Ultimately, government officials concluded that population growth was no longer advantageous. The nation, they argued, could just no longer absorb so many people. Thus, Mexican government officials changed their position and started to encourage migrants to head to the United States as a way of reducing unemployment, urban squatter, and the other socioeconomic problems that Mexico was facing. Let me give you a couple of examples that illuminate this broad policy change from one that discouraged long-term and undocumented migration to one that encouraged it. First, from the 1940s to the mid-1970s, Mexican and US migratory officials had coordinated mechanisms to repatriate deportees deep into the interior of Mexico. They knew that if they released those that the INS had apprehended near the border, those, the apprehended, those deportees, would simply cross over to Mexico the following day, day. So the program worked like this. When Border Patrol officials apprehended undocumented migrants who were not residents of the border area, they handed them to Mexican officials from the Department of Migration, who were then in charge of transporting them deep into the interior of Mexico, generally by train. And in this picture, you can see um, Mexican officials getting ready to take um, those that were apprehended by the INS deep into the interior of Mexico. Now, Mexican officials sometimes discontinued this practice because it violated Mexico's constitution. Mexico's constitution guaranteed the right of citizens to cross borders and move freely throughout the Mexican territory. In October 1969, for instance, 
The Mexican government informed U.S. authorities that they would not train lift Mexican illegal entrants from the border at Tijuana to the interior, but then assured U.S. officers that if the apprehension rate continues to increase, uh, such a proposal might again be put to the Mexican government. U.S. officials did not have to wait long. On June 24, 1971, San Antonio's immigration chief, John Holland, reported that a plane full of illegal aliens were being taken to the interior of Mexico four times a week. Despite the illegality of transporting migrants against their will to the Mexican interior, Mexican officials considered it important to continue to support migrants' emigration. The Mexican government continued the practice of relocating deportees until the mid-1970s. Of course, at the point when Mexican officials started to look favorably on emigration, they stopped attempting to separate potential emigres from the border. In 1976, U.S. officials wanted to sign a $2 million contract with private companies to airlift deportees into the Mexican interior. The Mexican government refused to give these companies permission to land. Antonio Gonzalez de Leon, who worked in Mexico's Secretary of Foreign Affairs, maintained that his government could not provide any facilities nor collaborate in this type of activity. In the end, Mexico allowed the United States to repatriate up to 15,000 workers as long as they offered their consent and left no family dependents in the United States. The change in policy was apparent. Mexican authorities had gone from forcibly transporting migrants themselves to allowing only those who volunteered and left no dependents to be returned to the interior of the country. Let me give you another example of the ways in which the Mexican government switched its position, and that is employer sanctions. Employer sanctions were designed to fine employers who knowingly hired illegal aliens. Up until the early 1970s, when the Mexican government still condemned workers for crossing the border without papers, Mexican officials supported employer sanctions as these discouraged workers from going to the United States. For example, in October 1969, Mexican officials told US authorities that there should be some penalty against the employer who hires workers illegally in the country. This would discourage employers from hiring such workers, which in turn would discourage Mexicans from entering the country illegally. By 1977, however, the Mexican government came out strongly against employer sanctions. It publicly claimed that these would result in the extensive return of the poor to Mexico. The third example of Mexico's broad change in policy was that by the mid-1970s, the Mexican government started focusing on defending the human rights of undocumented workers. Often officials admitted to the relationship between human rights and the incapacity of Mexico to incorporate all of its citizens within the national territory. In a 1979 conference on migration, Mexican government representatives acknowledged that the Mexican government did not see itself as being in a position to solve the emigration problem in the short run, and they had decided to, att to attach higher priority in the short term to the problem of protecting the rights of Mexican migrants in the United States. They also now stressed the right of free movement within Mexico. Before the mid-1970s, the Mexican government had remained had silent on the rights of undocumented migrants. In all of the archives of the Mexican consulate in El Paso, Texas, which are stored in the Secretary of Foreign Relations in Mexico City, there is no mention of this matter until the early 1980s. Similarly, the Migratory Workers Archives, which document the instances in which consuls helped Mexican individuals in the United States, 
indicate that the concern over undocumented migration did not begin until after the Mexican government had altered its position on emigration. Mexican officials made their position clear to migrants. Up until the mid-1970s, they insistently told Mexicans not to migrate without papers, as this would leave them legally vulnerable and without rights. This strategy emerges in the correspondence government officials sent to citizens, such as in the letters they sent to Epifanio Quintin. On September 30, 1968, Quintin's son died from asphyxiation in Houston after being abandoned by his mugglers in a hermetically closed U-Haul truck with 46 other Mexicans while attempting to cross over to the United States. For Quintin's family, the tragedy was compounded by their poverty. As Epifanio Quintin explained to the Mexican consul in San Antonio, he could not support his son's wife and children with the five daily pesos he made as an ice cream vendor. Quintin requested that the Mexican government allow one of his other sons to cross over to the United States to work as a bracero to prevent his grandsons from becoming homeless. The government's official reply explained that they could not authorize the departure of Quintin's other sons because the Bracero program had officially ended. They added that they considered it convenient to emphasize that Quintin's sons not abandon their residence without the existence of a legally authorized work contract, as they would other ex otherwise expose themselves to leaving the country without the protection of the law and would run the risks to which those who break such laws are exposed. Before the mid-1970s, Mexican government officials insisted that migrants lost their right to protection as a result of their undocumented migration. In contrast, by the mid-1970s, the government repeatedly informed migrants of its aim to defend them. In 1978, Mexican officials publicly announced the opening of the first office for the protection of undocumented Mexicans in the United States. The office, which opened in San Isidro, California, would safeguard migrants whose human rights had been violated. Throughout the late 1970s, the Mexican press consistently published articles on the efforts of Mexicans, uh, uh, on the efforts of the government to defend citizens living in the United States. And by 1982, the government aimed to produce and distribute its Guía Básica de Servicios al Público, basic guide services to the public, which reassured that consuls would defend all Mexicans abroad. This new interest in the human rights of Mexicans who resided in the United States is particularly interesting given the government's blatant disregard for the human rights of those who still resided within the national territory. As Ellen Lutz from Human Rights Watch has noted, since the late 1960s and early 1970s, an array of abuses have become an institutionalized part of Mexican society, including killings, torture, abuses against independent unions, and violations of the freedom of the press. Officials' interest in the human rights of citizens in the United States and their concurrent lack of concern for them when in Mexico was related to their belief that many of its citizens ought to live north of the border. After Mexican immigration policies changed, government authorities openly attempted to convince the United States to allow undocumented migrants to reside there. They even fanned out Cold War fears. In a speech delivered to US officials in 1979, Mexico's Secretary of Foreign Relations, Jorge Castañeda, asserted that the United States was not giving Mexico special consideration when it came to immigration. Given that there was no special relationship between the two countries, Mexico could also look to Latin America, as well as, quote, to Europe, Japan, the socialist countries. <laughs> 
In this not so veiled speech, Castañeda impressed upon the United States to, make, to take Mexican interests regarding migration to heart. So before I continue, let me summarize a little bit of what I, I've been saying. Up to now, I've been arguing that in the 1970s, ideas of welfare pushed the view that Mexicans did not belong in the United States. They encouraged US government officials to deport more Mexicans and made it harder for Mexicans to enter into the country legally. During this same decade, Mexican authorities themselves started to view emigration as a solution to their problems. While the Mexican government had previously attempted to act like a welfare state, state and still portrayed itself as such, by the mid-1970s, officials believed that the way forward was to encourage people to live in a country that considered them illegals. Here I want to stress that this is not what Mexican workers themselves wanted. In the letters that Mexican citizens sent to President Diaz Ordaz, they appealed to the government to provide them with a solution that would legally include them in either nation state. For example, one man wrote asking the president to help him find work in Mexico, or a loan, or a plot of land which he could work, or at least for a permit to work on the other side, meaning in the United States. The changing notions of the welfare state in both Mexico and the United States left this population without the right to belong to either country. Now, in the context of these policies, migrants created their own welfare organizations and through them pushed for their belonging at the regional, national, and transnational level. To demonstrate this, I'm going to focus on the activism of Mexican nationals living in Los Angeles. In 1931, Mexicans established the Comité de Beneficencia Mexicana in Los Angeles, often referred to in English as the Mexican Welfare Committee. By the 1970s, most of the members of this institution were Mexican migrants who contributed their own time and resources to help those in need. The Comité focused its efforts on assisting undocumented Mexicans because despite nativist stereotypes, they did not qualify for aid. And again, few of them dared to apply for aid illegally. Yet the range of the Comité's support was wide. It gave money to people whose houses had burned down, to those who had recently arrived from Mexico and could not find a job, to those who had become unemployed, to those who could not afford their hospital bills, and to citizens and immigrants alike. When one examines the applications for relief of the, of the Comité, it soon becomes clear that US restrictionist policies, which as we have seen, were influenced by the rhetoric of Mexicans' abuse of welfare, actually often drove Mexican migrants towards seeking aid. For example, in 1970, immigration officials detained 24-year-old Ubaldo Rosas to deport him back to Mazatlán, Sinaloa. On the train ride south, the officers beat him and confiscated his belongings. Fearing for his safety, Rosas jumped from the train, but he, he miscalculated the distance and fell, fell on the rails. The train severed both legs and two fingers from his left hand. Rosas came to require a wheelchair. His family, which remained in the United States, solicited help from the Comité. Border enforcement led Rosas to seek welfare aid. Yet rather than resorting to US state resources, Rosas depended on the support of other migrants. The Comité provided him with the financial support and the wheelchair he needed. The Comité became so influential that Mexican consuls in Los Angeles and even the LAPD often sent Mexican nationals to seek aid from this organization. In other words, Mexican migrants became central players 
in providing each other with inclusion and with their basic necessities in the United States. The Comité raised money primarily by renting out a building it owned called La Casa del Mexicano. It rented, this is how the La Casa looked, and it rented it out to migrant groups. These migrant groups were often known as clubs sociales, which are now known by their contemporary um, term, hometown associations, HTAs. Meeting at La Casa helped Mexican migrants feel like they belonged in the United States because it gave them a place to meet and fight the isolation they experience. But perhaps even more important, these clubs work to send funds across the border to develop Mexican communities. They thus acted very differently from the mutualista mutual aid groups that aided Mexican migrant communities within the United States that his historians have so widely analyzed. Instead, I argue, Club Sociales acted as an extraterritorial welfare state in Mexico. Activists have this same interpretation. In his unpublished memoirs, Raul Villarreal, one of the club activists, writes that his story is one of a simple dishwasher from a Los Angeles restaurant who, by working in Club Sociales, ended up helping the people of Mexico more than the government itself. These Club Sociales started out as small organizations. In 1962, a group of migrants, migrants from the small Mexican rancho of Guadalupe Victoria decided to raise funds to send to Mexico by coordinating small-scale picnics in Lincoln Park. Members donated food and then bought it themselves at the gatherings to raise money. And here's um, the first list of these clubs' um, money-raising activities, which you can see it's like very, very little amounts. They were very small-scale organizations. But migrants from other communities in Mexico after Guadalupe Victoria soon started to follow this example. And by the early 1970s, a true club culture developed in Los Angeles to send money back to Mexico. During the late 1960s and early 1970s, there were 20 clubs with approximately 35 members each. But according to activists, the number of clubs grew radically in the 1970s. Moreover, clubs involved many, many more people. The club culture that took shape in La Casa del Mexicano revolved around meetings and dances, which happened every weekend. These dances were large family events with 200 to 350 attendees. Members of the hosting club cooked and supplied food for free to all guests who would then pay for admission and for alcoholic beverages. Parties often began at 8, at 8 p.m. and finished at 2 a.m. As they roared on, children would fall asleep on the chairs or under the tables as their parents laughed, danced, and conversed until the music ended. Once they finished, migrants left with a renewed sense of community and belonging, the hosting club with a profit of approximately $600. Club members sent the money they collected to local agents in Mexico who were in charge of managing the funds. For example, the Club Social Guadalupe Victoria remitted the money migrants fundraised to club agents in the rancho, which is located in the state of Zacatecas. These agents then distributed it to the er elderly on a weekly basis. If the club in Los Angeles mailed more than expected, club agents in Guadalupe Victoria would purchase clothes or blankets for the needy. Finally, if the elderly became sick, agents would buy their medicines and take them to a doctor. As the club developed, it started to take on more and bigger projects. By 1987, the club had also painted and installed benches in the rancho's church, paved its main street, fenced its school, set up electric power lines, and brought potable water. In other words, 
Migrants in the United States raised money and club representatives in Mexico ensured that it was appropriately distributed. Together, they formed a welfare system that guaranteed that the rancho's basic necessities were met. By 1988, they had also built a clinic, and that's what the clinic looks now. I want to stress that the Club Social Guadalupe Victoria was not alone in its activities. Let me give you another example. The Club Social Santa Rosalia Camargo also took up responsibilities that belonged to the government, forming part of this extraterritorial welfare state. In 1975, this club started a campaign to aid Mexican citizen Antonio Ayala from Camargo, which is in the state of Chihuahua. Ayala could not afford the orthopedic leg he needed. The club raised enough funds for his surgery, his physical therapy, and his rent and food for two months. Responding to their service on his behalf, Ayala wrote to individual members of the club, ardently thanking them for their efforts. He ended his letter by saying, I can do nothing more apart from thanking you for the time you waste reading these lines that unfortunately are always a bother to you. Whereas in a functioning welfare system, Ayala would have paid taxes and received health care benefits, obtaining aid from the club stripped him from his dignity. He even felt that his letter of thanks imposed too much on his benefactors. Club members realized that they were taking on responsibilities traditionally assumed by the state, but argued that if they did not, the Mexican government would not either. As Gregorio Casillas explained to me in an oral history interview in Zacatecas, the government wasn't interested. For example, it is the government's obligation to provide what the community needs, like electric lights, clinics, schools, but unfortunately they don't do it so we had to intervene. Indeed, from the mid-1960s to the mid-1980s, the Mexican government, especially at the state and federal levels, ignored clubs. Finally, in 1986, Zacatecas governor, Genaro Borrego, realized that given the huge impact that migrants had on the state, he could not continue to ignore the activities of Club Sociales. That year, he agreed to develop a program by which the state government would match every dollar migrants sent for the betterment of Zacatecas communities. This agreement marked the first time that migrants were granted official recognition by a state government. In 1999, the Mexican government began the Programa Tres por Uno, Three for One, by which federal, municipal, and state governments all give a dollar for every dollar that clubs send. My project ends in 1986, when Borrego got involved with clubs' activities, and the US Congress passed the Immigration Reform and Control Act. While these actions brought about major changes in migration, the policies of the Mexican government and of the United States remained the same a policy of exclusion of ethnic Mexicans. Similarly, Mexican migrants still strive for, the for their own capacity to belong in either nation state and in the place they reside through organizations such as Club Sociales, as well as through their unsanctioned lives. Migrants' persistence in heading to the United States, as well as the border's increasing permeability to trade information and capital suggests that it is once again time to rethink migratory policies. Yet we cannot do so without understanding how this migration came about or the implications that it has had on Mexican communities on, in both Mexico and in the United States. Indeed, while the US-Mexico border has served to regulate migratory patterns, our analysis of the problem must continue to reflect its transnational nature and cross national boundaries. 
equally important. Our understanding must take into account the role of policymakers, of cultural representations, and most importantly, of migrants themselves. Thank you. So I have a plane to catch in a little bit, but I, have to, I want to answer as many questions as I possibly can. Julio, do you want to direct them or should I just filter them? Why don't I just, okay, so who has any questions? I would love to answer them. Yes. Welfare state. Yeah, that's. of the Club Sociales. So those are great questions. Thank you very much. Um, so when I defined it as an extraterritorial welfare state, it was sort of to complicate this idea that the Mexican government was just not providing what it itself had promised to provide, you know, what the PRI, the, the ruling party in Mexico, claimed to be part of the welfare state. So the PRI defined the welfare state as providing people with their basic needs and with basic infrastructure and did, need, did, did neither, neither of those, right? So it is at this, in this context that Mexican migrants are forced to intervene. So that's from the perspective of the state. But then the perspective of migrants themselves is really similar. Generally, we don't think of infrastructure, for example, as part of the welfare state. But when Mexican migrants talk to me in, the, in all these oral history interviews about how they conceptualized their project, they kept saying, you know, like, this is part of what we need for basic survival. And it was the same. It, roads matter just as much as providing aid to the needy. And both were seen in this context of welfare and of a failed Mexican state to provide those needs. So yes, it's very much in this nature of a failed Mexican nation state. Now, in, in terms of your second question about co-optation, all of the works that exist about Club Sociales right now start after 1986, um, when state governments started to become involved in the runnings of clubs. Um, at this point, they argue that the Mexican government sort of co-opted the activities, right? So for example, they're very angry that if you go to Mexico, now there are some fields, like soccer fields, that say, built by the programa tres por uno, three for one, um, which is a way of sort of you know, like encouraging people to vote for that um, party because it has a pretty logo. On the other hand, so that's a huge problem, right, that the, that the PRI is taking credit for part of what migrants built. On the other hand, it's also a problem that the Mexican government was completely ignoring the, the activities of clubs in an earlier period. Um, so migrants, for good reason, complain about both the ways in which the PRI has intervened and the, the way it's co-opted, what projects to take, take, how projects should take place, but also of its previous lack of, lack of caring for migrants um, before 1986. I hope that answered your question. Any, any other questions? Yes. With what, sorry? Absolutely. 
so, so there's many, many connections, right? Um, they all start after the period, as you noted, um, that I'm working on. The first parallel that I would like to draw attention to is the parallel of exclusion, right? If Mexicans have no way out, or Mexicans, especially from um, these central states um, where most migration has historically taken place, after the 1970s, even the idea of incorporating them and creating jobs in those areas ceased to exist, right? The idea was like, let them go to the United States. Well, if you grow up in one of these states as a poor working class person, right now you have two options if you want to have any economic opportunities. You either migrate to the north or you join a drug cartel. So this narrative of exclusion, this idea that um, Mexicans in some ways you know, have no, no home to call, call their own or sources of employment has definitely helped encourage people to join drug cartels. Um, there is also um, the combined history of smuggling, um, where drugs have often been smuggled alongside with people. So those two histories of border militarization, you know, the, the harder you make it to cross the border for both people and drugs, the more that it becomes illegal, right? And it needs to take place in Ill through illegal means. And that has definitely supported the, the buildup of cartels in Mexico. Yes? Uh, thank you so much. I think But I was wondering if you could um, talk a little about, uh, you talk about the exclusion of Mexicans, but also the inclusion of them. Um, there were a lot of legal mechanisms for, Mexi for Mexicans to nationalize. But certainly there, there were a, a harsh numerical quotas, of course. But there was family unification, which was over quota. And if they were undocumented, just having families themselves. Absolutely. Um, but also unions. Um, uh, you know, I read about a period in 1968 and 76 where it's kind of a three amnesty period where people could legalize for their children briefly for Mexicans, and then amnesty itself, you know, would benefit Mexicans and not, you know, largely Mexicans and not other uh, Latin Americans at the time. So, so I guess the balancing part of that, what, what about the, the, the law for mechanisms for, for that? Absolutely, that's a great question. Um, so. Up until 1986, right, most of this migration is circular. So it's not necessarily about residence in the United States. And in 1986, um, the law that passes, which is the Immigration Reform and Control Act, known in Mexican communities primarily as la amnistia, the amnesty, um, although it wasn't an amnesty, it was more legalization, um, had two different effects, right? And it, it caused the migrant stream to be, to be really divided. So on the one hand, it legalized 2.3 million Mexicans, right? That's a huge number. And those people could now reside legally, could get social security, could get licenses, had access to more jobs, had, had access to health insurance. Their kids could become legal. They could bring their kids and later legalize their kids. Um, so it produced that pattern, right? And people who became legalized um, in some ways started gaining permanence here because because they could get better jobs, because they had health insurance, be, suddenly staying in the United States for longer periods of time became worth it. So they brought their family. So it definitely created that inclusion, right? And I just want to put a little bit of nuance to that in the way of it did create legal inclusion and it provided them access to all these legal jobs. Racism and against Latinos continued to increase, right? So, so brown people were still seen as brown people. So everybody who I interviewed, doc claims, yes, our lives changed dramatically. That doesn't mean that we didn't continue to face racism. So that's one migrant stream. But it divided the Mexican community entirely. So a lot of people, the Mexican, the, the Immigration and Reform and Control Act um, only legalized people who had been in the country for five years, who did not have any criminal records, and who learned how to speak English. And that's why I say that it's hard to call it an amnesty, right? Because an amnesty is, is generally a law, a law that we think is just given on to people. But this was very much about acquiring these rights to legalize. So people who have been here for 30 years, but you know, arrived not within those five years of 1986, or couldn't prove that they had been here before, 
didn't get papers. And that really divided the experience of Mexican migrants into those who could reside here legally and those who couldn't, right? So inclusion is a huge part of the story, but also exclusion. And not only that, economic conditions in Mexico continued to worsen after 1986. So if anything, more immigrants kept coming. And the 1986 law didn't just come with legalization. It came with increased border militarization. So a huge number of immigrants start coming. They find that now it's really, really hard to cross. So right now, for example, the average price for a coyote, the, a smuggler, is $7,000, plus risking your life, right, while crossing. So they, no longer engaged in circular migration, coming back and forth across U.S.-Mexico border, but just stayed in the United States, right? They were facing economic difficulties in Mexico, needed to leave, went to the United States, risked their lives, paid huge amounts of money, decided to simply stay in the United States. So we have this permanent population now living in the United States, either with papers or without, um, but that still face exclusion, right? And, and, and the numbers proportionally have just continued to increase towards undocumented migration. So thank you. Another question? Yes, Professor. Thank you so much for your talk. I, um, as you were saying, especially at your conclusion, I was thinking so much about um, even something like a tres por uno. So, like, the, considering the great distrust of the Mexican government, for instance, in regards to these Mexican migrants. So, even for, even with the end of the Brasero program in 1964, um, I mean, there's quite a bit of stuff that's come out that the Mexican government, for instance, actually kept some of that money. You know, they didn't give back to Brasero. How, you know, how, I mean, in some ways, this is kind of speculative, but is there kind of a discourse today about sort of distrust, even with something about that, like with the Tres or, you know, to what extent then can these people feel comfortable with kind of delegating this responsibility to the Mexican government today? Right. Um, if anything, people just continue to mistrust. Like, fr from my interviews, it seems like they've never trusted um, the Mexican government, but that sense of insecurity and mistrust has grown even more with the growth actually of cartels in which cartels are seen as interlinked, you know, the drug trafficking with the Mexican government. They're very much seen as one and the same. So the distrust has grown. But yeah, so um, when Mexican workers came as braceros, as Professor Capo was noting, part of, um, part of their wages were taken away. 10% um, of their wages were taken away um, and the idea was that it would be given to them later as um, social insurance once they returned. And, and this money was never given. And now it's, it's died away over the past three years, but there was huge activism of returned braceros who wanted that money that was taken away from their wages. So of course, another sense of mistrusting the government. But the government was never really trusted, you know, like there's this idea that Mexicans could trust the government during the period of Lazaro Cárdenas, 1934 to 1940, but not really afterwards. Thank you for your question. Yes. That's a fantastic question. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, during the 1980s, right, civil wars in Central Americans, in Central America, Guatemala, Guatemalans in particular, during this period, start crossing the border, Salvadoreños, um, to go to Mexico. Now, if you think about Guatemala and Mexico, especially in that southern borderlands, had always had um, ties, you know, Mexico. Um, Mexico used to, Guatemala used to be a part of Mexico. And in the 1980s, as um, the Mexican government, Mexican officials, and these are Mexican top officials that I'm talking about, decide that there's just too many people, suddenly they're like, well, we don't really want Guatemalans to come and reside in the state of Chiapas. We want fewer people, people not less. So that's the other side of the story. It's not just about Suddenly, they start looking on immigration favorably, but suddenly they start looking on immigration as something that could hinder the, 
the country, which had never been seen that way before. Before they had tried, before the 1980s, they really tried to encourage Guatemalans to continue coming, to, to work in the coffee fields of Chiapas. But not only that, the Mexican government tried to negotiate with US officials that if they could control Central American migration going through Mexico, maybe the US government should not be so distrustful of Mexicans because they were not all communists, right? The Mexican government was stopping the wave of Central American migration and allowing Mexicans to go. So they try to make this barter, like we'll stop Central Americans through, growing, through, through going through our country if you allow Mexicans to go north. Give me one second. This, of course, increased the violence that Central Americans risked while going through Mexico. In fact, generally we think of the US-Mexico border as that line, right, that runs through it. But for Guatemalans and other Central Americans, the border in some ways became all of Mexico. They need, the same factors that we see in the US-Mexico border can be seen throughout Mexico. Smugglers crossing them, you know, violence, um, sexual violence and other types of violence against Central Americans. The last part of your questions, a lot of Central Americans, precisely because they knew that the Mexican government would deport them all the way to Guatemala, right? So Mexicans after the 1970s were no longer taken to the interior of the country. But Central Americans were taken all the way to Guatemala, El Salvador. So what we start seeing in that period is that a lot of Central Americans try to pass as Mexicans, right? So they, they learn the Mexican anthem, they learn Mexican words so that they can pass as Mexicans if they're stopped by Mexican immigration officials. Great question, thank you. Yes? So just building off of that question that she asked, so is it true that historically Mexicans haven't had a friendly stance really to other Central Americans emigrating north to the U.S. Mexico? Well, as I said, um, before the 1980s, um, before the 1980s, there just wasn't that much what we call transmigration, which is like Central Americans just, cro just using Mexico to migrate and reach the United States. That starts growing much, much faster after the 1980s. But beforehand, what we see a lot of is Guatemalan migration to Mexico itself and people staying in Mexico. Um, Mexican officials did not always welcome it, but when it came to the coffee fields of Chiapas, they did because they needed more workers during the harvest season. Any other questions? Yes. Well, I think NAFTA is um, very. Do you all know what NAFTA is? Okay, great. So, so NAFTA, NAFTA is very complicated, but NAFTA has encouraged further migration because it's made it harder for agricultural workers in Mexico. Um, for example, there was. I once was interviewing this man who told me that he used to raise chicken and that now it was cheaper for him to import the chicken, right, and buy them already cooked at a restaurant than to raise them. So he became, un like, he ceased to have employment. But not, not only that, NAFTA is a great um, point of contradiction and irony where commerce, right, where things can cross the border but people can't. And the, so, sort of the problems that that has created in terms of unemployment and in terms of the illegality of Mexican people crossing. NAFTA definitely contributed to the problems that the Mexican agricultural community was facing, which was a large sector. It wasn't the biggest sector, but it was a large sector of those migrating. So it did encourage or push people towards migrating in larger numbers. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, the interviews are, um, are, are, the are one of the, in terms of people, undocumented migrants have tried to hide, have tried to, left, to leave behind as little documentation as possible um, because they're undocumented, 
they have constantly moved from one place to another, you know, often because of deportation. So they haven't always left as much documents as, um, as we'd want. So oral histories is a way, it's a great way to capture their histories. Um, the way that I did it was um, I traced migrant communities on both sides of the border. So for example, um, uh, so, so people from Zacatecas, right? There's, there's a rancho in Zacatecas called Las Animas. And pretty much 90% of everyone in Las Animas migrated to South San Francisco. So first I went to Las Animas and lived in Las Animas for a long time, interviewed people, got to know them. And then because I'm able to cross the border with, with papers, I was able to go to Sa South San Francisco and meet people and interview them there, their family members, who they often hadn't seen in 20 years, and bring pictures and bring other things. But also, you know, like I already had their trust because I knew their family members back in Mexico. So I was able, to, in some ways I have the privilege, you know, to cross the border freely. And, and it also helped me build deep connections with, with communities um, on both sides of the border. And these sort of linked communities be between Mexico and the United States. Um, I tried to interview people, um, both men and women, people who identified um, as being a, of different sexual orientations, people of different ages. Um, do you have a more specific question that you were, well, do? We have to wrap up there. Well, um, <laughs> if you well, want, you can email, email me any other questions. I'd like to thank you all individually for joining us here today and also for being a part of Thank you for an excellent talk. Please join me in thanking um, Professor Mignon for her talk today. Thank you. Thank you.